notation and generalities on finite free resolutions. Resolutions. Uh, then there will be statement of the conjectures of the conjectures which are now theorems, of course. Now three, there will be some representation theory of GLN, basically definition of true functors. Four <coughs> will be <coughs> existence of pure resolutions. Five will be eisenbach schreier theorem. Uh, I mean, basically the facets, <coughs> facet equations, so and cohomology tables, tables of vector bundles. Oops. And six <coughs> open questions. applications okay so so <coughs> I apologize to people that attended, uh, attended yesterday's lecture because at the beginning I have to kind of repeat part of this because I <coughs> set up uh, the notation okay so let's start with this one so we'll be working on <coughs> a it's a polynomial ring, uh, x1, xn. Ring. M, uh, and uh, here <coughs> I also should say, we, uh, we say it's graded, uh, but graded in a standard way, the degree of xi is equal to 1. And M is a graded module. I bigger equals and I'm D0. It's a graded module. Finitely generated. And <coughs> actually, we'll be assuming that either M is of uh, finite length. And more generally, and kind of equivalently, uh, we, uh, we can assume that or that M is a Cohen-Macaulay module. So of some co-dimension P. And so then the results <coughs> will be, let me just recall what a Cohen-Macaulay module is. So this means, that the depth A of M, so the length of the maximum regular sequence, is equal to the projective dimension over A M. Well, I'll still, it will become more clear as I go. So the point will be that whatever I uh, will prove, the point is that the resolutions of these are the same because I can always, uh, if I have a, a resolution, a uh, graded resolution of a Cohen Macaulay module, can always cut by the uh, regular sequence of linear forms to get to the situation of the finite length. So you see, <coughs> that's right. So if I have a really, a statement about resolutions of uh, module finite lengths in n variables, it will be the same as for Cohen Macaulay modules of codimension n, maybe in a bigger number of variables. So this will be so, but if you, we could assume this. And we'll be dealing with the finite free resolution. So, of course, as I said yesterday, it goes back to Hilbert <coughs> that uh, every graded A module. has a minimal free graded free resolution so let me introduce a notation for those so I'll denote then zero fn fn minus one 
f1 f0 and uh, this will be dn dn minus 1 up to d1 the differentials and now <coughs> So what, what I mean by that? So this means that this uh, uh, this is a sequence of free modules. So uh, modules F i are free graded modules. So this means I can write them as <coughs> direct sum over all j. Now a minus j uh, will be uh, a, uh, but with the generator in degree j. Okay. So a minus j equals a with shifted grading grading generator and degree j and of course this can be so here's the graded betty numbers appear of course uh, <coughs> module with the same shift could appear many times and of course so what we require from that of course d d n d n minus one are maps of graded modules meaning uh, maps of degree zero taking the i's graded component so d d i maps of uh, graded modules of degree zero So let me call this kind of uh, fat F, uh, and then <coughs> of course we need that uh, F uh, dot is acyclic, meaning has no homology here, all the sequence exact up to here, and then the only homology H0 of F is isomorphic to M, and of course the third that F is minimal. i.e. this means that uh, di of fi is contained in m times fi minus 1 where m is a maximal ideal ai okay so really in practice uh, uh, we have uh, <coughs> that we can choose a basis in each of those uh, three modules and then uh, I can think of uh, those maps as being matrices of polynomials and all polynomials will be homogeneous of positive degree right so there will be no so that's the and then of course those beta ij's are uniquely determined by the module m if you set up those conditions because again well, you have the minimal set of generators and then you take the kernel and you continue. So let me put the same example as yesterday on the board. <coughs> that this was this uh, A equals KX1, X2, because this will be using this example. And I take M equals KX1, X2 divided by x1 squared x1 x2 uh, x2 to the fourth so then the resolution is uh, <coughs> the module is generated by one generator because it's cyclic yeah, so it's for resolutions you don't write it but okay let's and then there are two relations there are three relations so there are two relations in degree two and one relation in degree four because these are the degrees and here so this is x1 squared x1 x2 x2 to the fourth and then there are two relations in this case <coughs> so one is x2 minus x1 zero this time x2 minus this times x1 is zero and then this time x1 with minus times this times x2 cubed is zero and this means that this has to this relation has degree three because it's uh, two plus one so it's uh, a a minus three plus and the second one has degree five and okay so that's that's <coughs> my main example that I'll be 
working with, uh, showing the numerics. <coughs> okay, and so then the point is that remember, now we have this definition of the Betty table. Beta of M. It will be just this infinite table. <coughs> beta 0, 0, beta 0, 1, beta 0, 2, uh, sorry, beta 1, 1, beta 2, 2, etc. This is beta 0, 1, beta 0, 2, etc. Uh, so <coughs> this really gives you all the numeric information about the resolution. So in this case, <coughs> our Betty table would be one. There's one generator on degree zero. So in the first column, we get one zero zero. Uh, then here, there are two quadratic relations. There are no linear relations. There are two quadratic relations. There are no cubic relations, and there's one relation on the deg of degree four. And then here, there's one linear relations between those quadratics, so in degree 3, and one relation here. Okay, and of course I think of this as being like infinite table going up and down, but I can always fix. The table kind of can move up and down because I can always shift the grading in a module, right? So if I shift the grading in a module by one, say the whole table moves uh, down by one, so it doesn't matter. And uh, <coughs> okay. So that's the notation. Let me recall, yeah, let me give this example maybe in more detail, that the point was that somehow Betty tables do not behave <coughs> well up to uh, scaling because, so this example, that the Betty table 2-2 two, two, 2, 2, 1, 0, 0, does not exist, but the, uh, zero, sorry, 2, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, 2 exists. So I already explained yesterday, but let me repeat why this doesn't exist, because this would be uh, well, I would have some generator in degree 1 and then two linear relations, so we could think of this as being two variables, x and y, and then if I have two variables x and y, or say x1, x2, uh, then of course I have, I have to have linear syzygy, x2, x1, minus x1, x2. But let me make explicit now why this guy exists, because this is a very nice kind of resolution that I like very much. So why something with this Betty table exists? I'll cheat a little bit. I take eight variables, and because it's a nice determinantal thing. So let me just explicit this. So I take the following thing. I, I take a two by four generic matrix. x11, x12, x13, x14, x21, x22, x23, x24. And okay, so I actually treat it as a map A4 minus 1. So here's my matrix x21, x22, x23, x24. And then, in fact, well, you can even put it in Macaulay 2, I guess, and you will see that the syzygies will be like this, A4 minus 3, and the syzygies are given by 2 by 2 minor, so delta ij is a 2 by 2 minor on i's and j's column. So I get the following thing, delta to 3, minus delta 1, 3, delta 1, 2, 0, then delta 2, 4, minus delta 1, 4, 0, 
delta 1, 2, and delta 3, 4, 0, minus delta 1, 4, delta 1, 3, and 0, delta 3, 4, minus delta 2, 4, delta 2, 3. And then if you continue, you get a 2, 2 minus 4. No one has to be careful. The matrix kind of changes, but it's the same matrix, but <coughs> 1, 3, x1, 2 minus x1, 1, 1, and x2, 4 minus x2, 3, x2, 2 minus x2, 1. Okay, so it's not difficult to prove that this is acyclic. For those things, of course, we use this Buchsbaum Eisenbach exactness criterion, right? Let me recall while we are at it that, you know, if I ever write a resolution, I claim it's exact, it's acyclic, of course, then I can do it very simply by just Buchsbaum Eisenbach exactness criterion. which tells me just over any Netherian ring, I guess if I have the complex of three modules, uh, dn up to d1, <coughs> then this complex uh, f, then f is acyclic, if and only if, well, there are some criteria, so we have to have some notation. So first of all, well, those maps, I can think of them again as being matrices uh, with coefficients this polynomial in this ring, and then I can think of them as, uh, uh, so I have the, they have ranks, because I can take the biggest minor, or biggest size that is non-zero. So I, 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 I say that Ri is the rank of the i, and actually then it's very important to take i of di, consider the ideal of ri by ri minors of the matrix di. ri times ri minors of di. These are invariant, the fitting invariant. So. Okay, so then f is acyclic, and maybe I denote by fi, or maybe not, okay. So let's see, there, so two criteria has to be, two conditions have to be satisfied. One would be the conditions that you would get over a field. You see, if you have an acyclic complex of vector spaces, when a complex of vector spaces is acyclic, precisely when I have a vector he, uh, space here, the image has to be a, and so the rank of this map plus rank of this map has to be the rank of this vector space. Okay, because just counting the dimensions of kernels and images, so that's what we get. So, so, so one, uh, one thing is that Ri plus Ri minus 1 equals dimension of rank of Fi for every i. And this is with the conditions that Rn plus 1 is 0. So for that one it would just mean that the rank of dn is just is the rank of Fn. And the second one is that those ideals, depth of ideals i, r, i, d, i, has to be bigger than i, bigger or equal than i. So, you see, like in this case, uh, well, it's a simple calculation that, well, the ranks are 2, 2, and okay, you have to see here that it's 2. So, actually, this will involve, I think, Plicker relations or something like that. Maybe not. Uh, that's right, so three, three by three minors, well, you can see that they vanish, and then, well, it's a complex, so they have to vanish, and then the ideals of minors will be just the ideal of two by two minors of the generic matrix, so all the depths are three. So this is uh, acyclic by this criterion. And then, okay, this is an example in eight variables, but you see this is a coin Macaulay module, so I can cut now by uh, generic linear, five generic linear forms, and I'll get the same resolution in three variables, so I'll get this. Okay, so that's, uh, <coughs> so you see, you can see that uh, with respect to scaling, some funny things are going on, and that's in a sense the whole point, because the whole idea of, so the question of Boyce-Hederberg was, <coughs> they wanted to look at 
Well, if what are the conditions for something to be a Betty table? Okay, and they the compromise kind of they made, but the very brilliant insight was that they say said that let's consider the Betty tables up to scaling, and then the question it simplifies because of phenomena like this, but then. <coughs> Uh, it uh, admits a full answer, <coughs> so that's a beautiful thing. <coughs> okay, so what we do now, so the question is which Betty tables occur up to scaling? And uh, so, so with this uh, in mind, Boy and Seder work defines this normalized Betty table. Pi of M, basically by saying that Pi of M is a beta of M divided by summation beta zero i over all i. So we sum over all the number of minimal generators of the module. So you see then <coughs> we treat it as a, ve a vector in a vector space over rational numbers which has well infinite dimension because it corresponds to the entries in this table so we can think of this as being <coughs> zero n there are n plus one columns and then infinitely many rows. Okay, and the observation, the main observation, which is really the basis uh, <coughs> of what we'll do, is that this set is convex. <coughs> so the set of normalized. So, so. Uh, Why do you think normalized vectors? Hmm? Because one wants to consider them up to scaling. Mm -hmm. So you see. This example showed that somehow it could happen that some, like this 1, 2, 2, 1 did not exist, but 2, 4, 4, 2 existed. So somehow the conditions become natural only when you kind of consider them up to scaling. So you, so you don't care. Equivalently, you could say, you know, that there exists an n such that n times beta it's a Betty table, and you consider such tables, okay? Uh, because then the situation becomes easier. As, as, as <coughs> so, so observation: the set of uh, pi of m, such that m is a graded module, is convex. Because <clears throat> and I showed it uh, yesterday again, but let, let's let's do it. And let's see. So the point is that if I have m and n, I have beta m and I have beta n. Then if I take the module m to the direct sum p plus basically p copies of n and q copies of uh, n, then this will be p beta of m plus q beta of n and then what will happen is that what will happen for pi's so suppose that uh, pi of m is beta of m divided by I don't know this summation whatever by m and pi of n is beta of m divided by n, so this will be the number of generators, then of course pi of this, m plus p plus n plus q, will be <coughs> p beta of m plus q beta of n, but now I have to divide by what? What will be the number of generators? Of course, minimal number of generators will be pm plus qn, pm plus qn, so this will be <clears throat> right, that's right. So it will be something is funny, but uh, <clears throat> PM plus yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So this will be 
Pm times pi of m plus Qn plus pi of n divided by Pm plus Qn, okay? So you see, you see that those two ratios will up to one. So this will, you will get basically alpha pi m plus beta pi n, where alpha plus beta equals one. And uh, so by varying p and q, you will see the whole uh, the whole interval between pi of n, pi of n, not, not the whole interval, but all points with rational coordinates which are on this interval. So, so that, that, that in this sense, the set is convex, okay? So, uh, so that's the idea. So then you can hope that's a cone, I mean, that's a polytope, sorry, and then <coughs> that's, that's, that's what happens. So, and another insight that they had, even even somehow they connected with this result of Herzog and Kuhl, so they kind of guessed what are the extremal rays. So the extremal rays are pure resolutions. So let's uh, <coughs> pure resolutions. So recall uh, that the resolution zero. Fn, Fn minus 1, F1, F0, D1, and such that again Fi is A minus J to beta Ij is pure if for every i there exists Di such that beta I Di is the only non-zero beta ij. Okay, so um, in terms of a Betty table, it means that the Betty table will, for example, look like this. It will, in each column, it will have only one non-zero number, okay? <clears throat> and I already kind of indicated those degrees, and of course, uh, the sequence D, D0, D1, up to Dn are degree shifts. And they have to be increasing because the resolution is uh, minimal. So you see, this has to be the maps of positive degree. So for a pure resolution, <coughs> basically, uh, all matrix entries have the same degree. And this is d, di minus di minus 1. So examples we saw yesterday, but let's, let's put them up. Uh, examples, causal complex on variables. So this would be a, a to the n minus 1, x1, xn, and then the relations are a n choose 2, minus 2, etc., up to a minus n. So this will be the pure resolution with degree shifts uh, d is, uh, say, 0, 1, 2, up to n. And for example, uh, if for n equals to 2, we have determinantal examples. Or the, or the ones that I, the 2 for 2 uh, resolutions that I wrote also was pure. Um, and uh, for another example is uh, kind of Hildberg, Hild, Hilbert Birch example. Right? When I have, uh, so n equals to, well, Again, I will use more variables here, but it will be a Cohen Macaulay thing, so after cutting uh, by linear forms, it will reduce to n equals to 2. So if I have a n minus n minus 1, 
a n plus 1 minus n. So I here put a generic matrix x11, x1n, x1, xn plus 1, 1, xn plus 1n. And then this resolves the ideal of minus delta 1 minus delta 2 plus minus delta n, where delta n is n by n mi uh, delta i is n by n minor gotten by omitting the i through. That's right, maybe I have to write them in uh, maybe in, in different, I don't know. One has to check that the composition is zero. But so this this again is pure and this is a pure of, of with degree shift zero n n plus one for n equals to two. Again when we cut by the lunar forms. Okay. So that's the the pure resolutions, and then we had those uh, Herzog Q equations. So the point is that uh, <coughs> Herzog Q equation equations. So suppose now I have this pure resolution, and I call this just beta i in such situation. So then you see, and suppose it's a resolution of the module of finite length, then we can, we know that the Hilbert polynomial of this module is just the multiplicity because some of, well, some of the graded components will stabilize once you go past the maximum and then it will be this dimension. And then if one calculates the Hilbert polynomial alternating sum, uh, we get the following set of inequalities, or of equalities, uh, of linear equations actually, minus one to the n times beta zero beta n. And here d zero, d one, minus 1 to the n dn. So this you would get when you would get kind of derivative. When you take derivative of the Hilbert alternating sum of Hilbert polynomials, you get those coefficients. Here you get d0 squared. Here I should put minus d1. Minus d1 squared, minus 1 to the n dn squared. So in fact, you would have d0 choose 2, but after doing the row uh, uh, operations you could reduce to this, and then d0 n minus 1 minus d1 n minus 1, maybe uh, 1, yeah, Down to d0 n, sorry, minus 1 to the n, the n to the n, and this has to be, so you will get coefficients of the Hilbert polynomial 0, 0, 0, 0 from the top, and this, this one, well, for general Cohen Macaulay module, you will get multiplicity, but, but E of M, if M has finite lengths, is just the dimension of M over K. <clears throat> so that was, uh, it was a kind of interesting that this was known, uh, but even though it was not known whether those pure resolutions always exist, but if they exist, and then they satisfy this. And then one can solve the system, and that's what Herzog and Kuhl did, and you get this interesting formula, which kind of looks mysterious, but maybe when we get to the pure resolutions it will be. So of course, by Kramer's rule, up to scalars is a unique solution, okay? So we get So then, this means that there exists R such that beta i di is R times product k different than i, k different than zero, dk minus d zero divided by dk minus di. 
Okay, so this one just has to solve this system <coughs> and well, I won't do it here, but that's what one gets. And in fact, again, if, when we go through representation theory, actually it becomes slightly more clear what that means. Okay, so now we are, I think, ready to state those two conjectures of Boy and Sederberg. <coughs> Namely, and so the point is of those Kuhl, uh, Kuhl Herzog Kuhl equations is, of course, that the consequence is that you see that the normalized Betty diagram, that's right, so normalized Betty diagram, Betty, a Betty table of pure resolution is just uh, unique of, uh, for given shifts. Resolution is just depends, just depends, depends on this degree sequence d. So I denoted pi of d. Okay, because map to scalar, it was determined. So that, that's the main thing. And somehow this tipped off. <coughs> Boy and Sederberg. So again, since Betty tables exist in infinite dimensional space, we have to, it's the best is to fix attention to, restrict attention to the small, uh, finite dimensional space. So we do it by, uh, we fix the two degree shifts, the n and this uh, lower and upper and of course in such a way that they are one is bigger than the other coordinate wise so in fact we'll be ordering those degree shifts so we have this partial order right so we say that uh, whatever d is smaller or equal than d prime if and only for every i, the i is smaller or equal than the i prime. So it gives you the partial order on the set of degree shifts. So we fix two such degree shifts in, uh, that are in that relation, and we consider only resolutions that have are non zero in that region, right? So <coughs> again, consider. Betty tables non-zero between the lower and the upper. By this I mean the lower and the upper. So only Betty tables in this. So th these Betty tables uh, and normalized Betty tables will be just contained in a finite dimensional uh, space over rational numbers and then we can consider the two sets pi the lower the upper to be the set of normalized Betty tables pi of m such that pi of m is contained in our set x let's call this set x and we take <coughs> convex hole now another set will be the convex hole of all of those pure Betty tables uh, corresponding to degree shifts which are also in here such that the lower smaller equals in D smaller equals in the upper <coughs> okay so and uh, so, of course, we get finitely many points here. And uh, the point is, conjecture one said that uh, those two sets are equal. <coughs> so conjecture one. Pi the lower the upper equals convex the lower the upper. <coughs> so this means we get this picture that you see somehow there's this polyhedral cone. This is my set convex 
the lower, the upper. And all Betty tables will occur in that cone, and also we know that on every ray there will be at least one Betty table that actually corresponds to some module. But we don't know how far, how big the vector has to be, so it would appear. <coughs> but at least uh, up to scalar multiple, this describes precisely which Betty tables you can get. What is the large? Excuse me? Well, at that point it's not, not clear, you see. <coughs> so there are those two sets and they just say, we, we just, the conjecture says they are equal. If you prove the existence of pure resolution, then you know that this is bigger than that. Because if you prove the existence of pure resolution, since the set is convex, you see, so, yeah, so if you p p prove the existence of pure resolutions, you, you prove that all those points are in your set of Betty tables, and then since it's convex, automatically you have to get the whole set. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's right. But that's why the, the proof of the conjecture has two parts. You prove pure resolution, so you kind of fill the cone mm -hmm. with Betty tables, mm -hmm. and then you have to prove that there's nothing outside of the cone, so you have to uh, produce the facet equations. Okay? So that's, 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 that's the idea. But they kind of conjecture right away. And they actually proved it for n equals to 2, but you see, for n equals to 2 is kind of, well, I mean, it's such a special case because of the hilbert bird theorem that somehow it was not conclusive. Okay, and then the second thing is that the simplicial structure, the second conjecture, the simplicial structure, So the idea is like this, so I look at the set, the set of those uh, degree shifts which are between um, uh, the lower and the upper, is a partially ordered set. Uh, with the partial orders and uh, I just uh, exhibited. And now you see, so let's call this P, the lower, the upper. Maybe, well, okay, yeah. And now uh, we know that to every partially ordered set I can associate a simplicial complex, right? So let me just go through this maybe in a little more detail. So if P, smaller or equal, is partially ordered set, then I have the simplicial complex. Sigma of P. So this means that what? The simplices, simplices of dimension K, of dimension, dimension K, are chains x0 smaller x1 smaller smaller than xk in P, right? So then we get the faces on the simplex by just removing one, right, in all possible way. So, for example, if your set, example, if uh, P is just zero n, the interval uh, <coughs> zero one n, right, then the sigma of P is just a simplex. There will be one maximal chain, and everything else will be the faces, so we get a simplex. So, but, so you can do it in this situation, and, uh, and conjecture 2 said that uh, <coughs> conjecture 2 that the C convex D or the upper has a simplicial structure. So basically it's a geometric realization of sigma on P D lower D upper. Okay. 
So let me put the same example on the board as I put yesterday regarding this, because it's kind of the only one one can draw, really, that has some meaning. <coughs> So I was looking at the degree shifts zero to four. So this meant in terms of Betty tables that I was looking for n equals to two and for I was looking for Betty tables that were non zero only in this region because I have zero, one, two. 3, 4, so 0, 2, 4 is here. So <clears throat> basically, I have, uh, if I look at such Betty tables, the conjecture says that somehow the set of such Betty tables has, <clears throat> you know, it's a simplicial uh, of, of normalized Betty tables, it's a simplicial complex uh, associated to this posset that I drew, and in that case, it was this uh, 2 tetrahedra, uh, 2, yeah, that's right, 2 tetrahedra. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 4, 0, 1, 3, 0, 2, 3, 0, 2, 4. So you see what this means. So what do those conjectures mean here? So this means that any Betty table that is in this region so you see, this is okay. The, 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 the first conjecture just says that the uh, Betty table has to be a non-negative linear combination of those pure Betty tables that are all vertices. But this refined second conjecture tells you that if you have a Betty table, normalized Betty table, then it has to be either in that tetrahedron or in that tetrahedron. So it will be a non-negative linear combination either of those four or of the other four. Okay, so this is stronger. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the point of the second conjecture, and uh, and of course in this situation it's not that much. But of course, if your simplicial complex is um, if your simplicial complex is more complicated, it gives you. So you see, basically, what it tells you the second conjecture in general situation. Uh, what are the simplices of? Uh, Maximal dimension, I mean the phase of maximal dimension in your simplicial complex are maximal chains going from the lower to the upper. Okay? And you get such maximal chain, you know, you get by, if you get, get from, the, from some D lower to some D upper, the maximal chain you will get when you will start kind of jumping by one. Okay? Moving by one. So, the, so, so basically, the conjecture then says that any Betty table that is in this region will be a non negative uh, linear combination uh, of uh, normalized Betty tables that are in one maximal chain. Okay? So, so you know how many of them you will need. Okay, so let me um, show you. <coughs> actually how it works and this actually shows also the motivation of uh, Boy and Sederberg because they kind of started playing around at the beginning and they started uh, playing with Betty tables and with those pure Betty tables and they devised this algorithm. There's actually an algorithm which actually for a given Betty table tells you right away what is this linear combination. So let, let's do this example how it works. So let's start with the Betty table that I drew at the beginning. 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Okay? And so, <clears throat> so this was really, uh, this uh, what I think computer scientists would call the greedy algorithm because it kind of right away you predict in which simplex you are. So what we want to do, we want to write it as a non-negative uh, linear combination of normalized Betty tables. It's a normalized Betty table because the module was cyclic, so there's one generator, I didn't have to divide. Okay? And the idea is as follows. You see, we look and kind of we look at the up, uppermost degrees that are non-zero, so we get the degree shifts, in this case 0, 2, 3. Okay, so then we look at the what would be the dimensions in the pure resolution that we have here. Okay, in this case, it's actually this will be zero three two. 
because this is kind of inverted determinantal thing again. <coughs> Actually, no, it's a determinantal, just Hilbert Birch thing, so you know what the dimensions are, but you also could see them from the Kuhl equations. And now the point is, what we do, we subtract from this the biggest rational multiple of that, such that I still get non-negative entries. Okay? And that will be the... the, the so, <coughs> what is the, the biggest multiple here, such that when I subtract, I still get non-negative entries. Well, this will be one half, because you see, uh, if I get past one half, this will become negative. Okay, so I write this, and then I look at the rest, <coughs> so I get one half, zero, 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 one half, zero, 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 one, one, okay, and now <coughs> I look at uh, the biggest pure resolution with positions with those degree shifts, 0, 2, 3, 5. And now I ask again, what would be the biggest uh, rational multiple of that pure resolution that I can subtract from this? So I get, <coughs> okay, so I get 1 half, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, 2, all zeros, plus, and now you see my multiple, my, my, Pure resolution turns out to have dimension 0, 2. Okay, well, I mean, I took some, you know, the, the smallest integral vector on that ray, so you can check it from those Herzog Kuhl equations. So now, which multiple would be the biggest multiple such that the difference will be still non-negative. Well, of course, I, I can only get one-tenth, because if I get past one-tenth, this will become negative. Okay? And then when you calculate the difference, you get the following table. <coughs> you get one-fifth, zero, 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 1, 4 over 5. And then you realize that at that point, it's kind of you reach the lowest possible pure resolution, and you realize that this is just 1 fifth times, uh, so let me just rewrite it, 1 fifth times 1, 5, 4, and then you see again that it's reverse Hilbert Bird, that's a pure resolution. Uh, corresponding to these degree shifts. And it turns out actually, you know, first by experimentation, it actually always works. So that's how you find, uh, uh, for a given Betty table, this algorithm actually always gives you the, the right answer. It follows from the theorems, okay, and somehow you can do it, uh, <coughs> you can do it in, this, in this way, okay? Okay, let me just point out also that uh, <coughs> Uh, the motivation, so these are two conjectures, so next time we'll start with representation theory and then we do the, 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 the proofs, well, not, not full proofs, but whatever one can do in two hours. Let me just mention also that what was the motivation, kind of direct motivation of Boy and uh, Sederberg, this was this multiplicity conjecture. Uh, <clears throat> Herzog, Huneke, Srinivasan, and this was this following conjecture that if I had uh, well a mod i is a graded Cohen Macaulay module. And then I denote by, well, maybe let's call by beta lower i, the lowest degree in fi in the resolution, and beta upper i, the highest degree in Fi, 
then <coughs> then the this was beta one beta a, beta s lower over s factorial so it was current macaulay module of codimension s then it was supposed to be smaller equals than multiplicity of m smaller equals than beta 1 upper beta s upper over s factorial so you see there was kind of it was quite popular conjecture in <coughs> in uh, coming of algebra some people were writing a lot of papers on this and then it turns out well i mean i'll, I'll tell you indeed but but it follows basically like in one page from this because basically somehow See, this is a statement that, that is kind of uh, will not change when you scale the resolution, okay? Because if you take like direct sum of m many times, uh, those degree shifts will stay the same. Uh, multiplicity will increase, but then this s. So, uh, so then it admits a very very easy proof. I'll show that. I mean. So this was their motivation, actually, this completely solved this conjecture that before was kind of known in only very, very special cases. Okay, so I think now it's a good time to break. So next time we start with representation theory and prove the pure resolution. So this will be lecture two, and lecture three will be the facets and uh, relation with vector bundles, okay? Monday, yeah? hmm? Next Monday. The, on Monday, that's right. Yeah.